Now, I'd like to introduce Sue O'Keefe, who will be presenting a paper on behalf of herself and uh, Lynn Grace, looking at managing uh, critical managing the environment for water that's being recovered. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, today, what I wanted to do was to uh, focus our attention for a little while on some of the big picture management questions that uh, arise from the expanded environmental water holdings of the Commonwealth Government. Um, basically, the structure of this presentation is I want to briefly look at the current situation um, and, and also to canvas some of the alternatives that have been suggested and then to move on and pose some questions rather than give any answers um, that relate to challenges for the future. So from a policy perspective, it will not come as news to anyone here that uh, the past two decades has seen substantial reform in water management in the Murray-Darling Basin. But we also realise that this is set to change markedly in the future. The catalyst for this change is twofold. Firstly, the buyback, and secondly, uh, the Water Act and the uh, ensuing Basin Plan. Firstly, to look at buyback, uh, as of December in 2010, roughly 1,000 gigalitres of water had already been acquired under the Federal Government's Restoring the Balance Program. The Environmental Water Reserve is also set to expand with more than 2 billion earmarked for water buybacks between 2009-10 and 12-13. And we can add to this uh, the supposed water that's recovered, as uh, Dave mentioned and I've heard a few times in this conference, from publicly financed infrastructure upgrades, um, leaving aside that whether or not that saved water is actual fungible water is, um, is still somewhat contentious. The upshot of all this, though, is that a substantial volume of water is going to be on hand to meet environmental demands, whatever they might be. Um, so the Water Act of 2007 requires a delivery of an inaugural basin plan and central to the Act is the notion that state control of water resources has failed to deliver adequate uh, environmental results and that intervention is therefore required at an overarching uh, federal government level. The basin plan is to set new sustainable diversion limits which will ostensibly reset and enforce a cap on extractions. These new sustainable diversion limits are purportedly based on a scientific assessment of the water needed to deliver defined environmental outcomes, and states will be legislatively required to comply. The impact of all this is going to be to up the ante on delivery of environmental outcomes. Now, the underlying assumption of the Basin Plan appears to be that transferring a lar large volumes of water from private consumptive uses to a public entity... Oops, sorry. Um, ..will actually deliver environmental dividends. Uh, related to that, the notion of addressing over-allocation in the Basin is presented as a policy objective in its own right. The consequence of this, however, has been that entitlements have been purchased without closely considering the environmental objectives to which they might then be assigned, especially in the early phases of buyback. It remain, uh, it's obvious then that serious challenges remain in terms of how best to manage this environmental reserve. So the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder has been created as a result of the Commonwealth Water Act and the CHU is a holder and manager of tradable water entitlements purchased by the Commonwealth. Importantly, entitlements secured through buyback retain their same characteristics and this implies that CHU is subject to the same rules and constraints 
as those who hold similar assets. The Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder manages its held entitlements in line with the environmental watering plan, and this forms a part of the wider basin plan. The environmental watering plan is required under the Act to set down a range of principles relating to the deployment of the environmental water reserve. These principles are uh, the overall environmental objectives, uh, so that they need to specify overall environmental objectives, targets by which to measure progress, an environmental management framework for planning, methods to identify environmental assets, principles to be applied, and methods to be used to determine priorities. Uh, and also the principles to be applied in environmental watering. Uh, obviously, no small task. The environmental watering plan focus, focus is on high level and long term goals. And so what is really required is a mechanism that can deal with annual variability uh, and demands. In the absence of the environmental watering plan, uh, the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder has set a framework for decision making in 2009. Now this framework looks like this. Uh, all um, very sensible steps, uh, nicely worked out. However, the amount of scientific data that's required to to work through these steps is uh, indeed quite onerous. Importantly, data must also be assembled across a large number of dispersed and ecologically diverse uh, sites in order to reach a centralised decision that optimises the deployment of this environmental water. In this context and uh, in recognition that, that we don't yet have uh, this uh, particular set of data, um, Juhar in 2009 acknowledged that the tools that enable this framework to be implemented, including the means to prioritise based on ecolo ecological significance, require further development. Uh, presently, the CHU has relied heavily on advice from the Environmental Water Scientific Advisory Committee, and once again, in the absence of the necessary data, they've employed an approach that centres on a qualitative review of information. Now this is not to say that uh, there hasn't been some delivery of uh, environmental water under this system and uh, there has recently <coughs> been um, delivery at the Hatter Lakes where the um, Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder joined uh, some of their water alongside water from the Living Murray and uh, also worked with the uh, Mallee, Mallee Catchment Management Authority. And the Living, just very briefly to mention the Living Murray, the Living Murray itself has a complex hierarchical and interjurisdictional requirements um, and importantly the water that's held as part of the Living Murray uh, resides with the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and not with the Commonwealth environmental water holder, which leaves some questions about um, coordination and so on. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority endeavours to coordinate activities across all living Murray sites, but activities at individual site levels are administered and delivered by relevant agencies within each state. In the case of sites that span more than one state, like the Barma Millawa Forest, there is another layer of decision making in the form of joint management group that comprises representatives from both states. In sum, the existing arrangements, um, uh, top heavy as they are, leave limited opportunity for on ground environmental managers to respond flexibly. There is also scope for the pol politics to overtake the science, surprisingly. In the case of the CHU, the Act allows for directions from a minister which potentially could compromise operational decisions. And the situation is further complicated if, as predicted, the Basin Plan results in a large number of new ICON sites 
and an accompanying large volume of environmental water, the coordination demands can be expected to uh, expand dramatically. And so basically, uh, the challenges in managing environmental water, to me, centre on management and coordination challenges. Um, a common theme that's been expressed uh, by a number of commentators is scepticism about the ability of a federal agency to deliver dispersed and complex ecological outcomes at multiple sites. There's a further issue, uh, there are many other issues also around the question of uh, specification of rights, um, but that's beyond the scope of uh, what I want to talk about today. So what are some of the alternatives that have been suggested um, in recent times? Well, firstly, um, Jeff Bennett has noted the importance of information flow. And he's noted that there uh, is some involvement of water traders and trusts, but the exchange, the information exchange between these entities is poor. And the prospect that environmental flow choices made by each of them separately may not generate the best available outcomes. 